Hi, uh, welcome to Boxer's NDI5 remote production webinar. Um, I'm here with Liam um, from NewTek. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate so many of you have turned out. Um, thanks for coming. Um, lots of people here from many different backgrounds. So we've got a lot of things to talk about today. Um, there will be something for you, no matter where you're from. Um, if it's not quite your bag, hang on a minute, and then I'm sure it'll come back around to the kind of use cases that you have. A um, couple of notes here, we're recording this. So if you'd like to take a look later or pass it on to a colleague, um, there'll be a link that comes around shortly afterwards uh, that you can share. And also we would love questions. And if you look down the bottom somewhere, there'll be a Q&A button. Uh, if you have any questions, please type away uh, in there and I'll review them periodically um, or at the end. And we'll try and answer as many as you can now. If we don't get a chance, if we're running out of time, we will come back to you individually um, and, and answer any questions uh, that you have. So um, brilliant, thank you very much. So um, let's kick off. Um, we thought we'd start by looking back. It's kind of been an odd year. Um, where we started talking, I guess about 18 months, two years ago, we were talking about disruption. And at that point we were talking about IP uh, arriving in the video world and all the things it was gonna enable and all the things that it was gonna do that would really change, fundamentally change the way we worked. And we were talking about how big that disruption and that change was gonna be. We weren't even close to realizing how big the change that uh, was being forced upon us uh, was going to be. Um, this is a slide I keep going back to, I, I, I love it. I think it describes completely the situation that we've been in and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, COVID has had a massive impact. And I heard this quote this week uh, at the DPP event, um, COVID has become our CTO. It's false things that would never have happened. And, and a kind of a, a running commentary that a lot of people are saying um, is that COVID's forced about seven years of organizational change in just a year. And what's that meant? Well, everything we knew um, that was going on before has stopped. You know, conferences, trade shows, big meetings, everything stopped. Um, and lots of these things helped define the way people were, helped define the way marketing was. If you look at our own industry, if you look at TV and broadcast, IBC, NAB, two trade shows physically defined product launches. It physically defined really the cycle um, of, of the years uh, and the marketing releases during that year. As soon as those things disappear, what happens? How do we talk to our customers? How do we talk to people? And that same thing has been repeated over again and again and again in different industries. Lots of things that we knew, whether, whether they were our industry or just things that we liked stopped. We lost concerts and live, we lost sport, we lost even things like the Olympics ended up moving, things that you'd never have said could happen in the past. I mean, it really has, it has been quite a year. So what happens next? Where do we go from here? So lots of things are changing. Hybrid working is something that we're reading about and we're doing. Everywhere now is moving to a different model. Our companies want more flexibility for their staff. Staff want to be happier. People want to better work-life balance. The world is changing. And it was forced on us, as we say. And it didn't all work. You know, some things when we moved to Zoom and Teams um, worked and some things didn't. It was often done quickly because we had to do something. But very quickly, we also learned new words, grid blindness, zoomed out. Things have to work for us long term. And, and perhaps the sticking plasters that we used to start weren't quite enough. And our feeling is that television, video, compelling content is the way forward. So this doesn't really matter whether you're an enterprise trying to get your message out um, to your people. And actually, if you're in television, which some of you obviously are, television's always been the answer. Right? This is the way we do things. But television's great for communicating. Um, it's good for communicating um, with, uh, with uh, documentaries, with news, if we're trying to do sort of non-fiction material, if we're trying to teach, but it's also great to entertain. We tend to work in a couple of different modes. We think about live. So live TV, live sport, X Factor, those kind of things are live events. You know, they're big TV, they're, they're, they're things that engage great lumps, you know, great, great um, numbers of people, they're event television. But also that same feeling, that same live environment can be moved to whether it's an all hands meeting or a product launch or something along those lines. There's nothing like the energy of a live event to keep people uh, interested. If nothing else, it's to see when things go wrong, which may occasionally happen in this presentation if you're lucky as well. 
But also, we are now all Netflix children. We are on-demand people. If we want to time shift it for our own reasons, um, or we want to change time zones uh, for international viewers and watch things at a more convenient time, or go back and watch things again, content that can be made available on demand uh, is very, very useful. And obviously, video you know, is a great way of doing this. It's just expected now. So we've started to see things change. We've started now to look at moving away um, from some of the spaces we had in offices, perhaps you know, big conference rooms are uh, being changed to multi-purpose spaces that can now be a TV station. Um, New Tech and the TriCaster products have brought the price of building a TV studio down massively. And it doesn't matter whether it's for a CEO's address to their people or whether it's a, a TV uh, broadcast channel doing a piece to air, the same technology can be used across that board. Training has been completely changed over the last year. You know, people have got to do things differently, uh, whether that's a speed awareness course that I absolutely didn't do last week, or whether it's corporate training. There are, there are many options of people who need to do things differently. And essentially, the message is that we're all people, uh, all people now are content creators. We're all trying to get um, content out there. For the TV people here, remote production is now very much a thing. So before we were shipping around people, we were shipping around equipment to wherever the event was. Now we can save costs by keeping everything in one place. We make our rig time smaller. We travel less with people, so they stay at home. There's a better work-life balance. And from an eco perspective, shipping around less kit is better for the planet. So remote production is here and it's here to stay. So how do we achieve these things? How do we make this work? So we decided to look for the partners that we have that got something interesting to say. And New Tech, um, with their launch of their NDI 5 protocol, have brought in so many new functions that really help make the kind of things we just talked about there a reality. Um, NDI has been out now for, I think, five years. We're on version five, as I say, NDI 5. It's a mature protocol. It's being used by hundreds and hundreds of use cases, thousands of development cases are being are out there in the market now. It's um, you know, been a great product. It's been a great technology that we've used with many of our suppliers, but New Tech have brought it to another level now. And I'd like to say hello and introduce um, Liam from New Tech, who's gonna take us through this in a little bit more detail. Thank Thanks you. Mark, cheers. So uh, my name is Liam Hayter. I'm Senior Solutions Architect at New Tech. So just going to go through a couple of use case examples of how we've seen NDI scale out, uh, particularly over the last 18 months, and also dig a little bit more into what makes NDI 5 uh, an evolution from what we've done with NDI, 5, uh, NDI to date, as well as looking into how uh, tools like Bridge are going to enable remote production as well uh, within your workflows. So uh, main thing at the moment is we need video more than we ever have done before. As Mark said, you know, there's not a single vertical that's not been touched uh, by uh, having to change and work with in a remote or in a hybrid environment uh, over the last 18 months. So it's everything from broadcasters to streamers, teachers and educators to trainers, people delivering sales and town hall meetings have all had to move to remote or hybrid or combinations thereof of production and content creation. And in fact, we now live in a world in which more video than content than ever is being produced, and we need to be able to do that in the most efficient manner possible, which is where NDI really lends itself to enabling that at a price point that is accessible to everybody, but also enable you to use tools and technologies that you already have off the shelf, combined with other products out there that support NDI. But in the last 18 months, as we've moved to actually enabling video conferencing and the remote production side of it, now it's about how we raise the quality of that game. How do we move this from uh, using the tools that just mailed us to make do, to do it in a high quality, efficient way around the world. The traditional silos at the moment are kind of blurring all together. If we look at broadcast technology, communications technology, and AV technology, if anything, the last 18 months has accelerated the blurring between these two, enabling people to choose the very best products to actually fit the requirement for the type of content that you want to create. And this is put simply because these are all becoming increasingly computer-based. With computers, obviously, comes software. Even in FPGAs or field programmable gate arrays, you find a majority of hardware, there's still software running at the core on those. With that comes them all becoming network linked, so we can start interoperating and delivering data between these different types of uh, media content creation. And the good news is, is that it's actually NDI that enables you to bridge across all of these different areas and many more, including things like post-production now as well, 
to enable you to actually create different environments and creating types of content that perhaps we've not even thought of yet. The new tech ecosystem is vastly extensive from cameras through to input and output devices, but also very streamlined. And if you combine that with the third party ecosystem of NDI devices out there, because we made it an openly accessible protocol for both software and hardware, it really does give you those building blocks to create these types of new media environment. So let's have a look at what some of our customers have been doing over the last 18 months. We're seeing an increased convergence, as you said, between broadcast and AV types of deployment as well. We have customers that are not only just building a media studio for corporate use, but they're also driving their auditoriums, multi-purpose rooms, video conferencing suites, all centered around NDI, enabling true interoperability. This means that meeting rooms can become overflow rooms for auditoria. Multi-purpose rooms can actually become part of or an extension of your media studio and actually start mixing these all together. If we put video conferencing into the mix, this enables you to turn what you have on site inside out and actually start bringing in remote participants and guests as well. If we look at the legal space where we have customers like the UK Supreme Court, of uh, UK and Ireland, and also sites across Europe as well, they are building out NDI estates, which will enable you not just to have video and audio being moved around a courtroom and recorded for compliance purposes, but also these can be linked together so that spaces can again interoperate with one another. We can do overflow spaces very, very easily. But crucially in the cases of sites like the Supreme Court, they also enable you to actually stream out on the network as well for public engagement. So here in the case of the, the Supreme Court down in London, we're actually by streaming out to Microsoft Azure, they're actually able to reach 7.5 million members of the public for uh, actual live streaming and all major news outlets as well from that same NDI network and environment. We're also starting to see NDI get used within the medical space as well. Because our TriCaster production systems actually like the TriCaster 2 Elite natively support onboard video conferencing integration. We don't need additional computers and devices. We can run services such as Teams, Zoom, Discord, Tencent and Slack directly on the production system itself and still leverage an NDI network for the rest of the devices. But those don't have to be local either. On a particular project that we're working on at the moment, we actually have a local hospital network with NDI running on uh, NDI PTZ cameras across hospital beds. The TriCaster production system is based six kilometers away in a data center, and this is actually using NDI version four, using UDP. We can actually traverse great distances with NDI already. We have customers that have SDI going in in Manchester and decoding it from NDI as SDI the other side in Wales as well. So we'll be able to do long distance for quite some time. Down at the hospital end on this project, we use our live panel web GUI to actually operate the TriCaster for staff so they can use devices that they already have on them. We also use NDI KVM to actually provide remote access via any Windows PC to that system in the data center. At the other end, we actually enable doctors and uh, universities and other researchers to actually access that same infrastructure by joining in via Microsoft Teams, enabling bi-directional communication between the hospital and remote medics and doctors so they can actually keep learning about the current situation as well. If we look at live performance and music, we also now have customers building out like the London Guildhall School of Music and Drama, where they now have actually built a single unified network, not just across multiple rooms, but actually two buildings and 90 individual spaces. This was originally built to actually enable the gold medal competition. So here we had the conductor isolated in their own room with NDI feeds and an NDI camera, along with Dante Audio, and actually distribute an orchestra across uh, the, the two rooms, uh, sorry, four rooms at the time, to actually enable a competition and performance to continue. This is then bridged together using a TriCaster, and again, also live streamed as well to be able to remote, reach remote audiences, parents, and those that want to watch the competition as well. The reason I'm bringing up these case samples is actually it just shows how much NDI has grown. People want to start using more sources. We're reaching larger scales of production, but also over greater distances as well. And now, of course, people want more destinations. We want to have more remote sources across geographies and greater distances. But of course, that raises concerns around security and more. And this really then brings us on to how NDI has actually evolved uh, in the latest version of NDI as well. So if we look a little bit at actually what that now means from a technical perspective, 
the NDI5 SDK and the new features of an NDI5 uh, are quite uh, pretty numerous, to be honest, but we're going to focus on a couple of them today. If you want more detail, you can visit ndi.tv forward slash SDK to get more detailed information. Um, but just to give you a quick summary, the main uh, additions to NDI now are reliable UDP, which enables us to support tools like NDI Bridge that you'll see shortly. Redundant discovery servers. So if you don't want to use the automatic discovery mechanism of NDI, we can effectively create software lighthouses to actually handle the discovery and handoff of, of sources and allow you to be more granular within an NDI network. But that now features redundancy. So if one was to fall over, we can have a secondary unit. We can now choose the preferred NIC for NDI. Traditionally, NDI has gone out on all the available network ports, which is great for ease of use, but not great on an enterprise scale. So now we can choose where NDI is going to go out or in from the machine. We've enabled ARM support. So that includes Apple M1 processors, Android devices, iOS devices, and more that can now encode and decode NDI natively. And also now what we call NDI Genlock, which is really actually enabling us to resync timing on the local network from a master device to the others, but also do that over greater distances as well. In terms of the NDI transport, it has evolved pretty significantly uh, over the last few years since we launched it in 2015. We've gone from single TCP when we launched to UDP with forward error correction multi-path TCP in 2020, and now with NDI5, reliable UDP. The good thing is, is all of these are actually supported and you can move backwards and forwards between the different types, depending on the type of network you're gonna wanna build, because each one has got its own characteristics, which lend themselves depending on the workflow that you want to try and achieve. So some cases you might want single TCP on an older network. If you want to actually go over wide area private WAN, you might just wanna use UDP, uh, but now reliable UDP is aimed to actually start bringing everything together as one protocol almost to, to manage all of it, but you can move backwards and forwards as you need. So let's look at what that actually means. So just to give you a very sort of top level example, obviously there's more granular detail to these, but just to illustrate what the differences are and what they mean as simply as possible, I'm gonna have two devices on a network. One end, it's going to be our NC2IO device. So this is eight channels of SDI in and or out from an NDI network. This will also support 4K and 12G, but we can bridge across accordingly. At the other end, we're going to have a production system running on that network, which is one of our TriCasters, and we're going to connect them both using two one gig NICs. Now, under single TCP, what this means is video and audio feeds will form single streams across the network between network points on the device, the fabric and the receiving device. Now it could take different routes, but each stream is gonna be on a single network port. So at some point you may reach a degree of congestion. There's no way really of controlling that. Now, when we first started with NDI, we were talking with smaller scales. And the good thing about single TCP is it meant it would work on almost any network, including those that are already out there, and is very easy to deploy. However, it's not great at large scales and it's not good at great distances. So with single UDP, which we introduced with NDI 2.5 and is still available within five, we changed the model slightly now so that actually instead of sources going across uh, an individual NIC or stream at a time, we can actually alternate the packets and split these between multiple NICs, effectively giving, uh, giving you a degree of link aggregation without the needs of that complexity or having to set that up. So data is alternated and transmitted across the network. Now this added a slight overhead to the CPU use, but the good thing is, is A, it allows us to scale up. If you have more network ports, you get greater bandwidth and you could evenly balance that. But because UDP is a send and forget type of mentality from a networking standpoint, unlike TCP that can re-request and say, I didn't get that data, can you resend it? With UDP, we can just send and forget, which meant we could already start doing cloud style implementations or wide area network implementations, albeit without any security. And also because it's UDP, there's no packet retransmission. What we can do is tell the receiving device to actually use forward error correction. And that meant that we could say, okay, if you don't get that packet, here's what you need to do. Please wait for the next bit. We're gonna resend it. It allowed some communication. So it was an improvement over UDP, but again, it did enable us to start doing greater distances and scalability. Within NDI4, we enabled multipath TCP, which takes us another level. It still has the characteristics of TCP where we can re-request packets, 
But what it enabled us to do is if you have more NICs, we could scale up because it would identify every available path on the network and split a stream into at least four. So this enabled us to have a degree of resilience on the network. Of course, it did add complexity as well. You know, not all networks could handle it, but where resilience was key and scalability of bandwidth was key, <coughs> it works really, really well. However, just like single TCP, it doesn't traverse for cloud or wide area network deployment like the UDP model did. Which brings us on to reliable UDP. This is the part that's in uh, NDI5, and I've just realized that, yes, I've put reliable TCP, it's reliable UDP, sorry, I made a typo. But what's different about reliable UDP is we can do some more clever things with packet reordering on the network here and a bit more. It's really built for things where you might have two and a half G, 5G, which are becoming commonplace on motherboards now. Even 10 gig has fallen in cost to the point where it's more widely available. So we're going to take advantage of that. And so in this case, NIC1 is going to be a 10 gig NIC. And what we can do is in reliable UDP mode, we're actually going to reorder the packets into a single stream across the network point to point and actually then decode those at the other end back out into the NDI feeds. What this means is we can actually be more efficient with greater bandwidth network ports. We can still traverse the public internet, wide area network and cloud because we have the characteristics of UDP and that it can be send and forget. But crucially, reliable UDP can re-request the packets in data if it gets lost in transmission, which is what gives us the reliable aspect. So in effect, reliable UDP is gonna give you less congestion on your local networks, which is gonna give you vaster scalability. It's gonna support public internet traversal, which is gonna enable you to connect sites around the world but also enable packet retransmission, which gives us that reliable aspect as well within that. And so it's pretty groundbreaking as a protocol goes for carrying NDI and is still fully interoperable with the other versions of NDI that precede it as well. Brilliant, thank you. So there's a hell of a lot in NDI 5. Yeah. There's, no, there's no two ways about it. Um, we wanted to guess, get to the crux of what that means for remote production. And um, we've got a, a graphic of a cloud up here um, most people immediately go cloud when you're talking remote, you know, remote production. Is the cloud necessary? Are you using the cloud? How does it link together and what makes it fundamentally work? Yeah, I mean, just like we said about uh, AV broadcast and uh, you know, video communication or combining, really cloud is just another tool at your disposal. I mean, a lot of people think that when we're talking remote production, it's got to go into a data center. Our video switches have got to be based there. All we need to do is get video and audio out of, say, Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure. Actually, really, it's just another building block. You might want to have some services in the cloud, but other times you might want to host everything locally as well, which is where we start looking more at distributed production rather than exclusively cloud to deliver remote and hybrid ways of working as well. So in this case, you're avoiding, uh, I guess, the, the, the ch charges of being in the cloud. You've got no ongoing charges, no egress cost. And you're, you're simplifying the system quite radically. Yeah, really. When, when we look at bridge in a little bit, you see exactly how that's going to work. But really with uh, NDI5 and reliable UDP, it means we can actually start bridging things point to point. We can have a local area network connect to another one. We can have individual sources distributed where we need. There is going to be some running cost and that you're going to still need to have an internet connection, but it's designed to be able to scale and adjust with that depending on the connectivity that you've got. And reliable UDP without the bridge technology is also actually run over private wide area networks. So if you've got a completely secure private network, you can use reliable UDP direct in that manner. Um, but so the main bit is it's that ability that you, know, you can have some elements in the cloud when you need them. You can have bits locally and pick and choose depending on the budget and the architecture you want, but still stay within the NDI protocol without breaking out of that and no um, need, move, move, need to move to different standards and formats and add additional latency where necessary. Cool, perfect. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, sure. So uh, if we look at actually now going to part three of this, which is really about how we're going to start connecting these things up. And uh, already we've had a question around how we're going to do things securely within this as well. Um, so hopefully this is going to address some of that. And we'll come back to that at the Q&A in a little bit as well. Um, but really what we're doing is it's about point to point uh, communication, linking up not just video and audio, but much more than that, but also the ability to link multiple sites simultaneously within that. As you say, it's about NDI being a single transport for local, remote, and distributed and hybrid production as well. And whether that's AV or video or even post-production now at the same time. 
So let's have a quick look at NDI Bridge. So Bridge is one of the free tools from NDI TV that actually makes this possible uh, over the public internet. And it has three different states which are currently available to it. There is Bridge Local Mode, which is what we first launched with in June, and then recently Join and Host have been made publicly available as well. First off, we'll start off by looking at the local mode because that's actually going to explain a little bit more about the tool which applies to Host and Bridge, and then we'll come back to that in just a moment. But what you can do with Bridge is you can choose not only NDI High Bandwidth and a pass-through mode, but you can also choose NDI HX or NDI High Efficiency version 2 with a user controllable bitrate. It's an evolution of the original NDI HX that we launched with and actually now not only supports video and audio and control and tally, but also we can pass NDI KVM, alpha channel, multiple channels of audio as well through that protocol and up to 4K as well. So I know we're going to show something with this mm -hmm. uh, in a moment, but can you just talk for those that don't know a little bit more about NDI KVM? Because I think this is this could be a real game changer. Yeah, sure. So I mean, NDI KVM enables us on the network to take control of any device that's out there. So if I just exit the presentation very, very quickly, and let's just swap to my laptop in full screen. Uh, if I open up Studio Monitor on my laptop here right now, then there's a number of sources that are running on my desktop. So we go into the list. This is the NDI auto discovery list. So these are all of the sources that we have running here today. So we can open up things like our PTZ camera on the network and bring that up if we want, and we can take control of that. But if I go to the TriCaster Mini that's currently running on the desktop here at the moment, I'm just gonna set that to silent. I should turn that off. Now, uh, through my laptop on the local area network, my keyboard and mouse on this computer is now the keyboard and mouse of the TriCaster that we're using to drive and run today's show. And this is all real time anywhere on the NDI network. Now, it's not just new tech products that support this. Uh, if you install our NDI tool scan converter, which is how we've been bringing in the PowerPoint today and bringing my laptop on screen so we can do things like picture in picture like this. Uh, if you run that tool on any PC, you can actually take control of that on the network too. So that could be things like edit suites. It could be your graphic systems. It could be other devices that you've got if you want to enable that. So you don't need to be locally on the device on your network. But literally in this situation, that TriCaster, as we'll see later on, could be in another country. Yes. And you could be switching the sources that are local to that from wherever you are within very low latency. Exactly, anywhere of an internet connection. Because once we start using bridge and we start moving into the bridge mode, we're still using the high performance characteristics and very fast encode decode of NDI. And it's just how long is it going to take the signal to get there? And in most cases, we can we can be very, very efficient switching even on remote systems. Or if we look at it, we have customers using it for support now. You know, being able to dial into a remote system and configure a broadcast studio elsewhere or a corporate studio at another site, you can do that through NDI KVM using Bridge as well. That's a point that's often missed with people, which is why we bring it up. If you just see the number of things that go within an NDI stream you know the tally the ptz control uh the kvm alpha channel the audio all of those things wrapped up and the timing compared to other systems that are all separate it really really simplifies that process really does, it? Really, okay, really does. so if we just switch back now just for the moment what i'm going to do is uh just show you a little bit on a little bit more on the, the bridge side of things let me just get the powerpoint back up so if we actually just look at the local mode very very quickly and so these same things apply in host and bridge mode as well. But effectively, you run the bridge tool on a PC or a server. You know, you could build quite a high grade server with additional CPU and GPU if you want more streams available. Uh, but also equally, you could run it on like I am an Intel i5 or an Intel i7 PC with a gigabit link. What bridge does is it looks at your NDI network. It will discover all of the sources that are available on that network or the ones that you've made available and allow you to then transcode into NDI, NDI HX, or simply pass it through. Now, in pass through in NDI mode, it will just repeat it. So if you have a 10 gig NIC or higher, effectively this acts like an NDI DA, enabling you to repeat and generate more streams of the originating source without needing multicast. Now, it will add a little bit of delay to actually repeat that frame. And if you transcode, it's gonna add a frame to do the transcode but it does give you scalability without the additional complexity to generate more feeds. And on the right, you can see that we can switch between NDI, NDI HX on the output tab. There is an encoder part there as well, which is basically allows you to choose between H.264 and HEVC encoding. And then you can adjust the bandwidth anywhere from 1.6 megabit 
through uh, to, I think it's 200 megabits if you're using NDIHX. So you can tune it to the amount of bandwidth that you've got or depending on the application that you want to use this for. So some examples in local mode are perhaps I have an original NDIHX camera that I want to decode as high bandwidth NDI. I can use this to transcode back. So perhaps I just want to display a camera on a hardware converter that can't decode NDIHX. The other way around, if I want to do scalable distribution, I might want to take an NDI feed in and repeat it as NDIHX out on the network. An example here is where we have people building classrooms currently using multicast so that they can actually take a handheld camera from a member of staff or a PTZ and repeat it to every single desk in the classroom for our NDI studio monitor tool that you just saw just now. Perhaps producers and other staff want, uh, want their own feed at their own desk of a shoot that's perhaps happening in your studio. This will give you that additional scalability. So now let's take a look at actually going beyond the local network to the host and join modes, which is where we can start traversing the public internet. Exactly the same idea. We need an instance of bridge running on each side uh, of the network. So one where you're going to host the NDI bridge and one that's then going to receive it. And in fact, any of the additional sites that you want. Crucially, there's always one host. So that host is the one that has port forwarding on that network. That's what you need to enable on the router. And that's the one that's going to en enable the connection for everybody to come together. Within that, uh, we actually have an AES 256 bit encryption key that's generated by the host and then sent to our receiving part of the network. And it's only then that if you have that key and you send it to the sites that want to join the NDI bridge, do we enable you to even discover the sources and if you can't discover them, you can't see them. So it's completely closed loop unless you have that key up and running. So just for those that don't know, an AES-256 key, that's what the bank would use to encrypt your content going backwards and forwards to them for a transaction. Exactly. Right? It's the so highest. It's as high as you can get without a military license, basically. Yeah, it's the <laughs> highest level of encryption that's currently available. Um, and as I said, it's about, it's about authorizing between the two bridges rather than encrypting the video itself. So again, if you can't discover it, you can't see it, you can't access it because it's a pull mentality, you request a stream. And so this enables us to combine actually having security with encryption and actually having a model that's as fluid and easy to use as possible. So to answer, I think that hopefully that answers um, uh, your question, Kuhn. Uh, and it's, you know, I know I've done some work with this encryption as well. It's, you know, it's essentially uh, passes most of the infosec requirements that I've ever come across inside a company and people do like to give it, you know, give it a good try. But 256 is generally considered sort of the gold standard for most people, including, as you say, a medical application. Yeah, and, and you can use it on your local narrow network as well. If you want to actually bridge between different subnets or you've got different VLANs, maybe you've got an AV VLAN and a corporate VLAN in the same building, you could use Bridge as a way of securely actually authorizing connections between those as well. It doesn't just have to be over the internet. So there's multiple uses for this. And the security question comes up a lot with NDI. In fact, it does with all IP media protocols. It's not just exclusive to NDI. Uh, 2110 and others have the same challenges. Uh, one thing that's worth saying, yeah. I think that if, if I had to pick something over the last sort of 18 months that's, that's really changed, is people's willingness to use the public internet mm -hmm. to try you know, new things and to send video yeah. over it. If we, especially in the UK particularly, are very risk averse when it mm -hmm. comes to sending video. We have a lot of lines that already exist, you know, that are, that are you know, that have been around for a long while for moving video and putting it over the public internet seemed to be quite a risk for a lot of people. What we've discovered is that when people have tried it, when they've given it a go and they've done a POC, mm -hmm. then they've gone live with it, that a lot of people are moving quite quickly over to it because yeah. it works. I mean, the connections are so much better now. Yeah, when, when we've had to, and we've all been forced to sort of take these leaps and embrace these technologies. And I think it's partly where the video conferencing side really hit a plumb because you know, it was registered. You did have IDs and user accounts yeah. and so on. Um, but we could still bridge those into the existing networks, even with our existing tool sets. Um, but now that we can actually do uh, NDI in this manner across the internet, that, that changes things again a little bit more because you know, it's another tool to our belt. Well, and the other part of this production is, is worth saying as well, some people bought in video conferencing programs mm -hmm. directly in, which you don't have a lot of control over that yep. quality. Here, you're literally able to dial in the quality level you're happy right. with for the network that you've got, right? Yeah, and what, and what you have available to that as well. Um, so if we actually, uh, just very quickly, just before we go to a live example of it, I just want to show how this yeah, reliable UDP is going to work here with Bridge. You know, quick reminder, we're using uh, our UDP between those points. Effectively, we're reordering the packets, coalescing it across a single link between those two destinations. And that's effectively what happens in NDI Bridge with Bridge mode. 
in that you know, we can take anything up to NDI4 available uh, on your NDI network, whether it's using single TCP, UDP, and so on. And then we bridge those together and effectively we're sending reliable UDP back and forth between those two networks with that encryption. So we do get the packet re-requests, we do get the retransmission, uh, we get all of those great benefits that, that reliable UDP uh, can effectively bring to us on that. So let's have a quick look, a very live, a quick live demo of that. So I've actually got Bridge uh, running on my laptop here uh, right now for, for, this, uh, for this event. And down here, you can see that you've got the three tabs on the top. So we have host, join, and local. I am already running in host mode at the moment. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, we've got the groups to share. So this is where you can choose which groups of NDI you share out. You don't have to share everything. You could have a, this is the bridge group of sources and only certain sources could be shared out. We give it a name that's identifiable on the network. The public IP address is automatically detected by NDI Bridge. This is part of your port forwarding. So you need to make sure that you've got port forwarding on your router pointing to the device that's gonna host Bridge. Again, this helps with the security because not everything's exposed. And then finally, the encryption key underneath that. Uh, if you hit the copy and paste button on the right, that's gonna copy all of that information. So you can send on an email, you can pop it into chat. So me and my colleagues have just send us the link back and forth and within a couple of seconds, we have that up and running. Um, and then finally, your encoder settings. So that's where we can actually adjust that encoder bandwidth and actually, as Mark said, adjust that to the bandwidth you've got or the quality that you want. This isn't just a, it's, it's not an either or, it's, you know, it gives us that fine tuning. So we're currently running right down at the net lowest uh, 1.6 right now, uh, just purely for practical purposes. Well, it's probably worth saying here that we're running this currently on effectively a domestic cable modem yep. here for the office. We have a, we have a deliberately slow modem. Uh, which we use for such uh, such occasions for engineering, and this is going to somebody's house um, on a you know a fairly normal link as well. So no smoke yeah. and mirrors. We're not using anything magical here. These are these are pretty standard domestic links. Yeah, exactly. And if you look on here, uh, just at the bottom, you can see that we've already got one connection <coughs> running. So this is running, pulling. I'm being having 500 kilobit pulling. So you know how much data is being received and sent. And also it says we have one active client connection. So if we open up Studio Monitor, where I was just now using NDI KVM, just gonna pop that over to one side. I'm now gonna go into my source list here and you can now see that there is LJH Z book bridge. That's what I call my bridge. And I've got four sources available to me here. One of which is a PTZ UHD. And if I just enable that, here is my colleague Zoltan at home in Hungary. Thanks for joining us today, Zoltan. Thanks for taking the time out. Um, and straight away, just like with NDI, you can see that there's the NDI PTZ camera controls are now available on screen. So I can pan, tilt and zoom this camera from London all the way to Hungary and actually take control of the camera that's in Zoltan's home studio, recall presets and operate that. I can even open the web page for the individual camera control settings down there as well. Now, it feels like a Eurovision Song Contest moment. It does indeed. <laughs> So, if, you, if you wouldn't mind giving us 10 points, it might be the last time that ever happens. <laughs> especially with the ring light. You know? so, <laughs> Thank you. Um, but again, you know, this is using NDI. So now if we do a picture in picture of this, you know, even though Zoltan's on the screen behind us, he's on picture with you guys on Zoom. Uh, this is all done natively within NDI coming through this little TriCaster Mini on our desk and my laptop. We're not needing uh, a, a lot to deliver this right now. The latency now, is very good as well. Oh, it's, mean, it, it's it, quite surprising. It, it's frighteningly good, in fact. <laughs> Um, and if I go down now into this, this does mean that if we say go down uh, into my TriCaster here, I can actually then on the mini that's running on my desk, I can go into any of the input slots on my TriCaster. I can pull exactly the same source list up. Here's NDI Bridge. And now I can go in and I can bring in Zoltan's camera now directly into the TriCaster. So here he is on the bottom left. Now we retain all of the color information where we do, it's about data compression and bring that in. But again, on the things like our system, we can key, I can crop and remove the background on Zoltan. So, you know, if we wanted to, I can actually bring him in on screen at any point uh, within the production. So let's just grab him in now. So just gonna bring in Zoltan. And if I fade him up on the screen, you'll actually be able to see that he's actually there on the top right corner. And now Zoltan can be keyed over us where we are here in the studio here today as well. So it's quite uh, pretty impressive stuff that we can start gelling all of these different sources together uh, and start bringing those into uh, with it within the NDI network as well at the same time. 
Now we can go one step further. If I just now go back to the bridge, I also have Zoltan's TriCaster over in Budapest as well. So if I hit MultiViewer 1, just as we showed you NDI KVM on the local area network as well earlier on. Actually, let me just turn him off because he's on the screen now. <laughs> You're not going to be able to see a thing because he's in the way. Sorry, Z. So if I go over to the bridge again and actually hit Elite and MultiViewer 1, I'm now actually able to not only look at Zoltan's TriCaster, but I can also now go into his system. And at the same time, you can see I can fully operate that as well. So I can turn the logos on and off on screen. I can reposition the different graphical elements within that. I have full control over that system. Now, your mileage is gonna vary with positioning things depending on how uh, quickly or, or I think data is getting back and forth. Uh, but so this, very, change, very easy this to changes start the way you things. can do that though, right? Yeah. Because um, you can choose to take camera signals back to a location where you essentially switch them yep. if you've got enough bandwidth. But if you put the TriCaster where the cameras are, you can just bring the UI back mm -hmm. and switch that locally, which is going to make that a much smaller bandwidth requirement, right? Yeah, exactly. Or alternatively, you know, again, corporate customers, they say, okay, we're going to have satellite studios and hubs, which could just be a camera and a green screen. But you could dial in and operate that from your actual main production systems wherever they are, rather than moving kit about. Uh, we were doing some interviews the other day around the environmental impact. People were saying about how are we going to get to net zero? Well, let's stop moving so much kit. Yeah. We can remotely access it with a small amount of power. And again, we don't need to worry about how you know things are powered and driven. You know, we can have these little local sites and devices, and you know, re re remove the need for travel because we can bring everyone together in a really efficient, lightweight way. Well, it changes everything. I think what you can see here, um, we're showing you this presentation through a TriCaster. So we're using the TriCaster to actually do the presentation itself. So this could be a sales presentation for any industry or a TV show. I yep. mean, it really doesn't matter the same technology applies right yeah exactly we can bring all of these different elements together and you know still integrate with video conferencing as well uh, at the same time and build build these different types of setups and, and, and so setups out we didn't talk about this earlier but most of this presentation we're actually driving from a stream deck yeah. so we're actually driving from three buttons so <laughs> you know it can be designed for even non-artistic people to use i'm, I'm I put myself in that category. No, I mean, that, that, that's the nice thing with, with the tools that we have. You know, if we start, when we start building out um, what we have with the different components that we have, we can really automate even products like the TriCaster. So it can be simple button pushes for your operators, but we've got all that sort of background power that we can utilize through the remote connectivity from the KVM to web GUIs to, you know, devices triggering things like, like the Stream Deck, as you say. Um, now, in that demo just now, very quickly, you know, again, thanks for joining us for that. So you really appreciate it. Um, we were just doing two networks there. So you could see that I had all of the access to Zoltan's devices um, at his end, but likewise, he was able to see all of our sources, which is how he knew he was on air. So Z was getting a tally on his camera when we connected to him that said, hey, you're on air now. It was like, all of that's already handled within it. And automatically there's been no configuration here. I, I rocked up this morning on my laptop and we opened up port forwarding and that's about as far as we got to get this up and running, which is phenomenal. Um, there is a question uh, here and mm -hmm. it might bring it into where you're going to go yeah. next. So um, how do comms work between the different sites and how does your gallery tech director, um, you know, communicate if they're in different locations? That's really at the moment where video conferencing comes into itself. You know, you can still have those back channels using Teams and the other systems that you have. Um, at the moment, we don't have uh, like a, an NDI intercom that runs between these two. There are products out there that, that do that from other vendors. Um, but because we carry audio and video back and forth, it's very easy for you to set up an embedded audio channel that goes back to that remote location. Um, we can already send things like our inbuilt teleprompters back to that remote guest. So there are ways of architecting this. It's not like a default thing. But because it's not just video and audio, it's control back and mm. forth as well. You know, it's, it, we can build something out like that. Uh, and I'd be happy to sort of dig into your requirements a bit more uh, on another time and uh, we can have a look at that. So. I think there are some uh, products that are about coming out now um, that are doing end, an NDI version of an intercom, mm -hmm. which are being integrated, isn't Because NDI 5 has been out, what, a couple of months now? Uh, yes, it's yeah. June, June, I think. It was it's not really been long. So track of time. <laughs> there's a lot of development been going on, yeah. hasn't there, from, from the various different other NDI vendors mm -hmm. who are bringing things in. Um, so that if you if you hang around a little bit, I think there's a few more uh, few more products that are going to start implementing a, an intercom that's over NDI specifically. Cool. So thank you for that. Um, as we say, it's not just the point to point site though. It's that it's also multiple sites. Um, you know, you can link lots of different locations simultaneously. They all talk to one another. Um, there's a cloud icon in the middle there because that could be wide area network or public internet. It really is peer to peer. 
between these sites. And if somebody kills the host, it's going to stop all those other connections as well. So again, the host has complete control over who can share. You regenerate a new encryption key and somebody can't just get back in who you don't want there. Now, the great thing is, is that across our NITA ecosystem, Bridge is compatible with all of our products and all third parties from NDI version four and above. Um, so there's plenty out there for you to start building out uh, the different systems that you might want to try and sort of shape and achieve using NDI. And at the core of the new tech ecosystem, of course, is our TriCaster product line. As Mark says, we're using the mini here today to drive today's presentation. Uh, but really, the TriCaster at the different scales that we have uh, can all be fully enabled with remote. And in fact, every product that you see here from SDI input and output, 12G input, output, HDMI for you know, games console capture, if you want, and, and the cameras and tools, even Adobe Creative Cloud can all be enabled uh, using NDI and NDI Bridge. Um, so if we look at how TriCaster is kind of being utilized at the moment in these types of setups, you know, for those of you who don't recognize it, the TriCaster is over 31 years of innovation from us now. Uh, we launched the video toaster in 1990. That's the precursor. NDI arguably started evolving in 2006 when we start bringing, NDI, uh, bringing IP video in and out. And we've evolved ever since into the TriCaster Tilly and the Mini 4K that we're using today. Um, there's four scales. Uh, there's the Mini at the entry level going up to the TriCaster to Elite at the top. And it really ranges from eight NDI live inputs through to 32 and from HD to 4K. So you could have eight remote sources from anywhere in the world coming into one production system or 32 on our biggest uh, instance there as well. With the something like the TriCaster Mini, we're not only able to bring NDI in, but we can also bring in RTMP, RTSP, and SRT streams, even on our entry-level system, and loop in with video conference through Skype TX to Teams and Skype. We give you basic switching, uh, one 4K output, four HD outputs, recording, and more. Now, we even with a system like that, we can use it with Bridge, but also now Microsoft Teams as a video conference platform is fully interoperating with NDI, so we can actually separate out the callers and the audio from Microsoft Teams, but also return NDI back again. And we'd hope to see other video conferencing providers follow suit in time. So even with this sort of simple system, you can build a little hub studio that still has video conferencing aspects where NDI is not applicable and still combine that with Bridge. At the other end of the scale with the TriCaster to Elite, we can go even further with additional onboard SDI as well, which is converted to NDI but also support up to two 4K outputs uh, in eight, 4K and eight in HD, unlimited recording and much more. Uh, for those of you who are asking earlier on around audio uh, as well, we can embed and de-embed Dante, USB audio, AES67 audio in and out of our systems, and in turn offhand that to NDI because we have NDI audio direct now. So again, you could have a Dante talkback system that forms part of your bridge network with a TriCaster in the mix. For AV customers and like, and for OB customers, we can actually dramatically reduce the footprint of the amount of kit that you need, which gives you that real powerful hub for generating remote production and content. And as I mentioned, not only do we have Skype TX like we have on the mini, but as we showed you in the hospital example, we have support for Teams, Zoom, Discord, Tencent, and Slack directly on the box for the video conferencing integration side as well. So again, make sure that nobody's left behind even in remote working as well. So just to wrap up, though, there's a couple of things I just want to show you. Another aspect that's embedded in every TriCaster and another NDI tool is NDI Remote, which is where we've had a number of customers asking us for WebRTC support. NDI Remote enables you to use WebRTC from any web browser uh, and actually connect via the NDI.tv website using QR codes and web links. So it's just emailing a URL, just emailing a QR code or simply taking a photo of it to join any live production. And at the other end, that is converted back into NDI. Again, it's a fantastic fallback so that if you can't use video conference or if you've got a guest that's not technically able to use video conference or, you know, or use NDI bridge, they can simply join using a QR code and even a mobile phone over 4G or 5G. Now, if we just go back to those case studies right at the beginning there, this is where these start, same projects can start scaling up. And those customers that have already started building those infrastructures, like those real world examples, can leverage NDI5 and Bridge to do even more with the same infrastructure. 
For corporations, it's very easy for them to actually start building headquarter satellite sites. Perhaps they have their auditoriums, their main HQs built around TriCaster, built around NDI cameras and sources for their AV and production network. But they're still going to have remote satellite offices, smaller offices as well, that you're going to want to provide cameras and green screen connectivity too, because people want to encourage people to work back to the office space. So in this way, we can provide experiences and broadcast levels of production at the main headquarters that you can't get anywhere else, lower level ones at remote sites that can all still drill together for the ultimate town hall meeting, but also still have those video conferencing capabilities for workers that want to remain remote, but we can still communicate and work together. For the legal market, we're looking at this not just in the UK, but also across Europe, where we're actually having municipal courts and linking different courtrooms already using NDI across sites. But we can do this at an even greater scale again for witnesses and legal uh, across the network. For healthcare, it's the same thing. We can now link more hospitals in a secure manner. We can link in the universities and colleges as well that are training the next generation of medical staff into those sites and also bridge in through video conferencing to reduce the risk of travel uh, within the space. And if we look at venues like we had at Guildhall there, what about if we have distributed performance? For a while now, we've already been streaming into cinemas. You know, it's an ongoing thing that hybrid uh, production for uh, live theatre, for music, is not going to go away. But it's always been very much a push out. Using things like Bridge, we could actually have PTZ cameras on those remote audiences to bring them back into the same space so that the performers can see the remote audiences that they're talking to as well. And we can do that in an ultra low latency way that is very close to actually being there without breaking out to other streams and redistributing in other manners as well. And really the exciting part is when we start going beyond these examples, we look at even wider range of projects, we look at even more devices now, especially with ARM support and the like supporting NDI. And once everything can start talking the same protocols and we can start talking it across public internet, then the future is very, very bright and very exciting indeed. Excellent. Well, look, thank you, Liam. I'm, I'm aware we are running close to time here. Um, so I, I'd like to say that this will be followed up, as I say, with an email, um, which will give you details of how to contact us and what steps to take next. Um, I've got time for one more question that's in here, which is, um, it, what's the price of NDI 5? How much does it cost? NDI 5 is completely free, actually. It's part of the NDI tools that we mentioned today. So Bridge, Studio Monitor, you can download those from NDI.tv. Uh, all of our customers with our current generation systems, so all the current Windows 10 based TriCasters that we ship, our NC1 IO and NC2 IO products, even our instant replay systems, all have NDI as part of the latest software update. So it's already out there, it's already available. Um, and uh, like everything, our whole ethos is you, know, you buy into our system and we provide software upgrades rather than hardware uplifts. And uh, everybody can now take advantage of this straight away. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. Look, um, thank you everybody for joining us. We do appreciate your time. Um, we know that you have other webinars to attend and we thank you for joining ours. Um, as I say, we'll follow this up shortly uh, and we wish you uh, goodbye and have a great day. Thanks yeah, very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>